When you turn the light on, when you receive the light of life, it, it reveals who you really are. It reveals your true identity. Many of you here today are, have identity questions and wondering, allow the light to shine in your life and you will find the answer that you long for. In a world that is so con convinced that like any trouble whatsoever, they just run. I'll just go to the next thing. I'll find something else. Go to the next job, go to the next city, go to the next, just stay. Stay in the light. The world we live in, there is darkness all around. A darkness that you and I both know can be felt. Remain in the light. If you have a Bible, go ahead, open up to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and you can go ahead and put a marker in John chapter 8. John chapter eight is actually gonna be our focal text for today, but I wanna start in John one to kind of set the scene for you. <clears throat> as you're turning there, it's gonna be up on the screen as well. John chapter one, beginning in verse one, the Bible says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. John, he was not that light though, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That light being revealed in John chapter eight. Let's go there now, verse 12, the Bible says, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The title of the message today is this, I am the light of the world. We're gonna take a look at this I am statement of Jesus, its significance, what it means for us, and what Jesus is actually communicating to us through this. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for your presence. You most definitely are here. God, I pray that in the moments that we share that you would speak directly to our hearts. God, you would sort through everything and make it clear what you're speaking to each and every one of our souls. God, we love you. God, our heart's desire is to know you more and in knowing you more that we might leave here today a little bit more like you than when we came in. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, John, John differs in his gospel, in writing this gospel, inspired by the Holy Spirit, than the other synoptic gospel writers in that he doesn't follow the same chronology that the others seem to follow, does not follow the same timeline. Rather, John focuses on seven, on the seven major healing miracles of Jesus and the seven I am statements of Jesus in his book with the, with the purpose of revealing and proving to us as best he possibly can by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, that he is the Son of God, that he is the prophesied Messiah, he is the one that our heart longs for, he is the one that, that, that can take away all pain, he, he is the one that, that we long for, that we hope for, and in, in writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, he's, th those who are hearing this would have understand that, would have understood that this is the one that we have been waiting for. This is the one who, who we've been hoping would come and, and, and he is here. This is what John is writing and he uses these healing miracles and these I am statements to prove that point. In fact, in John chapter six, he will write under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' words, Jesus will say, I am the bread of life. In John chapter eight, Jesus will say, I am the light of the world, as we read. John 10, he says, I am the door and those who enter in through me will be saved. 
John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, Jesus will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John 15, concluding these seven I am statements, he will say, I am the true vine, showing us and revealing to us through these statements that there is in fact no substitute for Jesus in our life. There is, there is absolutely no substitute for he is everything. He is what this, what all of this revolves around. He is what everything that is good points to. He is the one your soul longs for. Everything else may work for a moment, but it perishes. But Jesus lasts forever. He is the son of God. And only Jesus can save us from our sins and give us the grace that we need to ultimately live for him. In fact, through these statements and through this statement, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, we will find that fullness of life is only found in him. You want the fullness of life? You go to Jesus. You want hope? You go to Jesus. You want any ounce of peace whatsoever? You go to Jesus. You wanna experience joy and contentment and wholeness? You go to Jesus. There is actually no other way. It doesn't get more complicated and it doesn't get any simpler. It is just Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the destination, he is the place. He is the one that holds everything together. And the better that we understand these I am statements of Jesus and this one here in John chapter eight and by faith apply them, the more we will grow in our strength and we will then in fact be able to run and not grow weary as scripture says, to walk and not faint. In fact, Moses understood this in Exodus chapter three. Moses being commissioned by God to lead the people of Israel out of Egyptian captivity through the wilderness and ultimately the, to the promised land. He is, he's leading these people, but he comes to, comes to the Lord in Exodus chapter three and he says, if you send me to go do this, I'll do it, but I need to know you. I need to know who you are. I need to know your name. It's not enough to just know about you. Hear me, it's not enough just to know about God. It's not enough to just know that there's probably someone or something running this whole show. It's not enough to know that, oh, there's somebody upstairs and I just hope it all, no, no, no. It's, it ought to be our heart's desire that we know God. And Moses says, if you're gonna send me, I must know who you are because they're gonna ask me, by what authority do you possibly have to tell us what to do and tell the Pharaoh to let us go? And I, and I need to be able to answer who sent me. And God in his grace and his mercy and his compassion knows that it's imperative Moses know who he is and, and tells Moses, tell him, tell them that the I am has sent me to you. Moses is revealing to us that that in fact, Moses seems to understand that it is impossible to accomplish anything for God if you don't first know him. I mean, you, can, you might think you've got all this together. You might think you know what you're doing and you're probably really awesome and you got it all figured out. But the reality is, is that if we're gonna accomplish anything of significance and value in this life, we must know the one who created us. We must know the one who holds this whole thing together. And what I love about God is that, that God tells Moses, God says, I see your heart to know me, and it's actually my heart to be known by you also. Do you know God wants us to know him? God wants us to know him because knowing God is actually the most important thing in all of life. I hope you know that. We live in a world today that is obsessed and infatuated with what my purpose is. I will answer that question once and for all right now. It's to know God. It doesn't get, it, there is nothing else. It's to know God and help other people know him. Now there's a lot of things in this life because of the gifts and the talents and the skills that God has given you that you get to partner with God and do some amazing things on this earth with him and for him. But ultimately the end goal and result of all of that is that you know him more and others know him more as a result of it. 
That is what all of this is about. He desires to be known. In fact, in Romans chapter one, you can go back and read it later this week, Romans chapter one, verse 20, the Bible tells us that all of creation is being made more and more aware of God's invisible qualities and his attributes to the point that they have no excuse. What does that mean? It means that some of you are in this room right now because God made it impossible for you to ignore him this past week. It tells us that, that in our life that, that God is so desires to have close fellowship with you and I that he is showing up in your life, wooing you to come closer to him, that you might know your heavenly father and know the one who knit you together. So he's showing up, inserting himself in your life, hoping that you realize and recognize that he is the one that you desire. He desires to be known. I'll say it this way, the better that we know the Lord, the more we will love him. And the more we love him, the more we will worship and obey him. And as a result, we will become more like him. And in these I am statements that Jesus makes, again, specifically looking at John chapter eight, verse 12 today, Jesus not only tells us who he is, but he also tells us what he can do for us and what we can become through him as well. John chapter seven, um, eight and nine, where our text is kind of situated right in the middle of. John seven, eight, nine, it's important you understand the context. The context of this, what's happening here is during a feast of tabernacles, during the feast of tabernacles or shelters or, or, or booths. And, and what happens is this is the celebration of all celebrations, okay? Consider like when your child turned one and you pulled out all the stops for their one-year-old birthday and then you just basically phoned it in for the rest of them, you know what I'm talking about? I have, okay, so don't make me feel alone. Um, but this is like the celebration of all celebrations. Like if you only had one opportunity to celebrate every good thing that has happened in your life and you threw the most massive party of all time, that is what this is. It's actually an eight day long, it's a week long party, okay? People from all over, thousands of people will come into the temple and they will gather at the temple. In fact, many of them will actually even set up temporary shelters, okay, uh, and live in temporary shelters just for this week alone. Why? Because during this week, they are celebrating, honoring, and commemorating the way that God led their ancestors out of Egypt through the wilderness. He protected them, he covered them, and he led them. And in fact, what happened is they would actually, in the wilderness, they had temporary shelters. Because again, they were led, scripture tells us, by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And so they set up these temporary shelters because they, didn't, they could not be bothered with permanent residences because their, their goal, their desire, what they were doing was following wherever the spirit of the Lord went. The Spirit of the Lord in the pillar of fire moved, they packed up shop and moved as well. And so this week they would sit in these shelters and what would happen is the priests would come and they would go into the center of the temple, into this court of women, that's what it was called, and they would, they would set up these massive candelabras. Now, these are not like the candles that are on your dining room table. These are not the candles you set up during Christmas on your piano, okay? These are like massive, massive, fires, ba torches, basically. And thousands of torches would outline the temple. And again, the significance is recalling and remembering and celebrating that God led their ancestors through the wilderness by a pillar of fire. So during this time, they are, they're celebrating how God took care of them. And it's in the middle of this moment that Jesus stands up in front of thousands and says, that's not, I am the light of the world. This light that you look back to, that goes out in the morning and you have to relight at night, I am the eternal light to the world. I was, I am, and I forever will be. In fact, I am that light that led you back then also. 
Jesus is making a confrontational, in-your-face, messianic claim that I am he. I am the one you've longed for. I am the one that you've been waiting for. Jesus stands up in front of all and says, I am the light of the world. Now, it's important that you understand that this, this statement was not met with like the greatest of responses. Okay, you can go back and read it, John chapter eight. In fact, all of the religious leaders are frustrated and angry at him even. They begin to try to even trap him thereafter with different statements and questions and they, they are not happy with what Jesus just said because what Jesus said is, I am son of God, I am he. And they're not, they're not cool with that, with that statement. They don't, they're not acknowledging that statement. And essentially what Jesus is saying is, there's all this light in the temple right now, and yet there is darkness in your heart because you miss the one who's standing right in front of you. I'm here. You don't need this light anymore. You don't need these candles. I am your light. I am the light of the world, which begs a question. Today, what we're gonna do over the next few moments is we're gonna answer three specific questions. And the first is this. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you will, those who follow me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Why do we need this light? Why do we need this light so badly? And the answer is this, because apart from Jesus, darkness is our natural reality. Darkness is where you and I live apart from a relationship with Jesus. It's all we actually know. No matter how much you think you know, no matter how much you think you know how to build a life and, and put one together, apart from a relationship with Jesus, darkness is your natural reality. Darkness was my natural reality before a relationship with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Genesis chapter one and verse one, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. That's how it was. There was no form, there was emptiness, and there was darkness all around. Does that describe anybody's life in here before you started a relationship with Jesus a little bit? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and then God said, let there be light. And watch this, and there was light. You know what I love about light? There, there's never uh, an argument uh, to be had with darkness when light shows up. There's never compromise. It's never a negotiation. When light is, darkness can't be. And he says, let there be light. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three says this, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, watch this, the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What is what is the writer saying? He, he's basically saying this, that, that apart from a relationship with Jesus, darkness is our natural reality. We don't understand anything. And ultimately, we're gonna see here in a second, we can't see. In fact, our, our, our culture knows this to an extent because we, we have these sayings in our culture today, right? To know something, to understand something is to what? It's to be enlightened. To not know something is to what? Be in the dark. To not know is to be in the dark. To know, for our eyes to be opened and to understand is to be enlightened, to have light shown on us. Look at this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse nine. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the presence or the praises of him who called you, watch this, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In fact, Exodus chapter 10 will, will show us a depth of this darkness that you and I experience apart from a relationship with Jesus. This is what 
is reality without a relationship with Jesus. Exodus chapter 10 will show that even one of the plagues that was sent to Egypt because the Pharaoh would not allow God's people to leave was a darkness that could be felt. That's the depths of the destruction of darkness that is our reality apart from a relationship with Jesus, apart from knowing and receiving this light that is Jesus. Psalm 36 verse nine, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Okay, so through all of those verses, we understand we're in darkness, it can be felt, it is heavy, it is weighty, we have no understanding, and we cannot see. Let me illustrate this for you for a second. Um, you've gotten up in the middle of the night to go get some water, right? And you've not wanted to like turn the light on because you don't want to wake the kids. You don't want to wake your spouse. You don't want to wake your dog. Or for the few of us that our prayer teams are interceding for even now that might have a cat, you don't want to wake the cat up either, okay? Um, the, you don't want to wake it up. And, and here's the thing, you wake up, you, you're confident, right? In the middle of the night, you're not really all there anyways, like you're half asleep, but you're confident. You're like, I put this stuff up in my house. I know where it is. And you're walking around, around the house, right? And you think you know where you're going, okay? You, you think you know, I know where the fridge is. I put it there, right? Like <laughs> I, I kind of organized this whole house. I built this house, you know, I know the route. And you go and a couple of months ago, this was me. I got up in the middle of the night, know where the fridge is, I'm going to the fridge. And um, I stepped on what could only be described as the sharpest nail that has ever been known to man before. Um, it was not a nail. It was the largest scorpion I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm, I kid you not, it was like this big, okay? Um, and so obviously, I did not go back to sleep, stayed up all night and repented for the way that I responded to stepping on that scorpion, <laughs> okay? I, it was not, <laughs> it hurt so bad. My foot swelled up and I kid you not, from my knee down, my foot was numb for a week, okay? Because of this scorpion. Here's what I found. I knew where the fridge was, but I was not aware of the dangers that lied ahead of me along that route. And as funny as it is, go with me for a moment, say so is true as we try to navigate the darkness of this world apart from a relationship with Jesus. You might think you know your way around, but you don't understand what lies ahead. You don't know what is around the corner. You don't know how to experience freedom. You don't know where you're going truly. And though I think I dodged the countertop, there was danger that still lied ahead. This is what it's like living apart from a relationship with Jesus. And so Jesus says in John 12, he says, while you have this light, believe in the light that you might become sons and, and daughters of the light. So the second question becomes then, what does this light do? If I understand the gravity of life, the, the gravity of the situation, and, and Jesus stands up in the midst of everybody and says, you don't understand how much darkness you're still walking in because you're longing for the one that is standing in front of you and you're missing me. I love your celebration. I love what you're remembering, but it is me. Know me. Don't know about what I did for those before. Get to know me. So we recognize the gravity of the situation. We recognize the importance of this light in my life. So the question becomes when I receive this light, what does this light do for you and I? And the first thing is this, this light that is Jesus brings life. John chapter eight, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. Now, pause. Jesus is the light of the world. Does not mean we will experience that light though. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Those who follow me will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. It brings life when we choose to receive him 
and follow him and go where he goes, recognizing how much we truly do need light in our life and in our hearts. It brings life. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. What is this revealing to us and showing us? Showing us that darkness leads to death and light leads to life. It's that simple. In fact, again, just kind of know this, just even like culturally, and you ever been stuck in the house for like a couple days? You've been sick, you hang out in the house or you know, for whatever reason, you just stayed inside in the house all day and maybe with the kids or whatever. And, and what does your body like subconsciously know it needs to do? You need to go outside. We go outside and we just sit in the sun even for five minutes. And what does it do? There's this, there's this energy that we get. There's this refreshing that we get, this fresh air that comes into our lungs. The sun, like just even a few minutes of sunlight after a long day kept in a, in a house that doesn't have, the, you, there are healing properties to it and so it is with the light of life. Apart from Jesus, there is, there is no life, friend. Only in him and by him and through him is there true, lasting, not just eternal life, but abundant life here on this earth. This light of Jesus brings life. The second thing that this light does for us is it reveals, it reveals things. Because without this light, you cannot see anything as you should see it. It reveals things as they truly are. In fact, the prophet in Isaiah chapter six will model this for us when he is, he is in the presence of Almighty God and the Bible says that he falls on his knees and puts his face to the ground when he recognizes the greatness and the majesty of the living God. He is drawn to his face and all he can utter is, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips. He acknowledges and is faced with the reality that he is not that great at all. And he is nowhere near God. It reveals, reveals the nature of things. It reveals where we really are. It reveals the reality of what's around us. Let's go back to the illustration I used just a moment ago of walking to the kitchen in the middle of the night. And, and you ever, you ever, um, and you're gonna, you're gonna know this, you, you ever walk and you stub your toe, okay? Um, or you step on a Lego or something, you know? Um, but you, let's just, you stub your toe. You, you ever turn the light on just to make sure your toe's still there? <laughs> right? You're like, there's a part of you that's like, if it ripped off, that was the time. You know, like if it was, I don't know if that's actually possible, but if it was going to, it would have been then. And then you turn the light on and what does it do? It, it reveals the state of how things actually are and you're like, oh, praise God, there's still, there's still five. Okay, we're good. It reveals things. You, you find yourself trying to navigate the dark and we've all done that where you put your hand out because you, th you know the countertop somewhere. You know, I put it somewhere over here. I know the high chair is somewhere and, and you can't, you, you mosey your way over to the light, you turn the light and you realize you're like six feet away from what you thought was really close. And, and we realize that it reveals things, how it really is. It, it, it reveals even to you your identity. When you turn the light on, when you receive the light of life, it, it reveals who you really are. It reveals your true identity. Many of you here today are, have identity questions and wondering, allow the light to shine in your life and you will find the answer that you long for. Look at Psalm 27 in verse one, the Bible says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Look at this. It not only does it reveal the state of how things really are, but it puts everyone and everything you face in proper perspective to where God is. Let, let, me, let me help you understand. David, I believe this is what David is is digging into 
when he walks up to the battlefield, Goliath is out there. Many of you know the story. Goliath is out there and he is taunting and threatening the army of God. And, and, and they're, they're standing around all of these soldiers and, and they, are, they are dressed, ready to go, dressed for battle. And they are standing there cowering in fear to a giant that lies ahead. And a young boy who has only spent his entire life up until this point getting away and getting to know his God is able to walk up to that giant and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dare defy the armies of the living God? How could he possibly say that? I'll tell you, the light of life had shone in his heart. And it put everything in proper perspective. It did not change how big Goliath was. It just helped him to know, in comparison to my God, he's nothing. Hear me, what you're facing today is big. It is a big deal. The challenges that you face, I'm sorry, and they, they are heavy. But in comparison to the greatness and majesty of the one true living God, you're going to be okay. When you walk in step with him and you follow him, you're going to be just fine. Everything find its proper place in relation to God. Psalm 119 verse 30 says, the entrance of your words. Again, remember John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So not only does it reveal what's truly there in it, and it reveals kind of how big these mountains or valleys really truly are in comparison to God, but it also reveals understanding. It brings understanding to you when you allow the light of life that is Jesus to shine into every corner of your heart. It reveals, brings understanding. I'll say it like this, light gives way to sight. You wanna see? Allow him to shine in your life. Third thing that it does, that this light does, is it exposes. It exposes. Now, before we get too far down the road with this one, let me be clear. It does not, the light of Jesus does not expose you. It exposes sin to you. It exposes the lies of the enemy that maybe you have believed that you didn't even know that you believed. It exposes things to you. It it shows you, hey, you didn't know this was here, but I want you to know it's here. Why? Because God desires to walk in close fellowship with you and I. And he does not want anything to get in the way of that fellowship. And so what, what scripture shows us is that this is, this is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. As we walk in step with God, the Holy Spirit convicts us of things so that we can remove them and expose them before God. We can, we can repent of them and we can remove them so we can walk in close fellowship with him. Now, let me help us all understand something today. Conviction is a grace word. Conviction is a grace word. Of the many layers of the grace of God, thank you, God, that you love me so much that you would send your Holy Spirit to convict me of things that could possibly get in the way of our relationship because you love me that much. You care for me that much and you desire to be so close to me that you don't want anything that could possibly separate us to get in the way. Remember this a solar eclipse that we all, you know, weirdly celebrated a couple months ago, you know? And we all go outside and we stare at the sun and then we like pray that like it doesn't impact our vision for the rest of our life, you know. That is what sin attempts to do in our life. Sin is like that, it tries to cover, it tries to snuff out the light of life that is, that is in us. The conviction of the Holy Spirit encourages us to bring things into the light. But guilt and condemnation cause us to keep things hidden in the dark. Psalm 139 verse 11 says this, I could ask the darkness, the psalmist says, 
to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. What is he saying? He's saying, in your presence, I can't hide anything from you. There's nowhere I can go and hide from you. There are no secrets that I actually have to God. He knows everything. I can't go anywhere. Everything is exposed before you. Again, conviction is a, is a grace word, that God in his grace would come to you and say, hey, there's something that is, that's causing some separation. And I, you can't afford it, and I don't want it. So let's deal with this, and let's keep going. Ephesians chapter five, verse 11 says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. The fourth thing that this light does is it leads us. It leads. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus says, follow me and I will lead you. I will be your life and I will lead you into abundant life. I am the way, I know where I'm going. Let my light so shine in your life so you can see. And just as they did in the wilderness, follow the light that is me and I promise you I'll take care of you. I promise I will guide you, I promise I will lead you. And here's what I love. Exodus chapter three, and the Lord went before them day by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the temple. And here's the beautiful thing is when you follow the leading of the Lord in your life, you know where it leads you? Besides still waters through every valley that you find yourself in, green pastures, along paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's where he leads you. So finally, if that's why we need light and that's what light does in our life, then what must I do? What do I what do, I do now if I've chosen to receive this light of life. Two things. Now that you are sons and daughters of this light, first thing is you must shine your light. Shine your light. Matthew chapter five and verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What, what is this talking about? It's saying that when you, when you recognize that you have received this light from Jesus, because hear me, to follow him is to have him. You need to know that today. To follow him is to have him. And when you have him everywhere you go, you get to shine this light that is Jesus to the world around you. And the Bible says that when you shine this light, men will see your good works. And here's the beautiful part. It will shine so bright, they can't even see you. And they are drawn to glorify the light that you and I simply are carriers and reflectors of. In fact, if I was smarter and planned an illustration for this, I would have brought the blight, brightest flashlight that I possibly could. And if we shut all the lights off in this room, every single one of them, and I just shined this flashlight directly from my face, straight out, you know what would happen? You wouldn't be able to see me because the light would be so bright, your eyes would literally be drawn to it. It would be all you see. You know that I'm there, but you have no idea what color my clothes are or all you would see is the light. So it is when you and I 
walk with the reality of we have him and we shine our light in the world around us. In fact, one of the best ways to spread this light of life is to simply see and respond to the basic needs of others around you. You know that the sweetest moments that I've ever had sharing Jesus with other people have simply come because I chose to buy the Starbucks of the person behind me. And then they're like, hey, thank you so much. You didn't have to do that. What's your name? I'm Isaac, yeah. Hey, are you from Arizona? No, I moved here eight years ago from California. Why? Well, came on staff at a church. And they're like, oh, people do that? I didn't, I didn't know they do that. Um, tell me more. And then you just, we just start talking. Or we're at the splash pad with my, with my daughters and they're running around and somebody else's kid falls and, and trips and you just go over there and you just help pick them up so they can get back to their parents and they come over and say, hey, thank you so much. I appreciate that. What's your name? And you just start talking and, hey, this is our family and this is what we're about and we moved here and, yeah, we go to a church just around the corner and you should come sometime and, oh, I've never been to church or I haven't been to church in a long time and it just opens up opportunities just because you simply responded to the basic needs of others around you. Hear me, there ought to be enough light in this room for your workplace. Look around just for a second. There's enough light in this room for the city that we live in. There is. Now, our heart's desire is that we, that there be more light. But just as my daughter, all she needs is the smallest little nightlight in the hallway to navigate the darkness of her room to mine in the middle of the night if she needs something. One little light provides enough visibility for her to navigate the darkness that she's experiencing. And so it is true with the world around us. Shine your light. Stop paying attention to being the only one at work. Praise God that you're there then. There's enough light in your neighborhood just with your home alone. Shine your light. Just meet the basic needs of people around you. Why? Because the obvious need will always open doors for you to speak to the truer need that exists. Jesus modeled this all throughout scripture, healed the paralytic. Oh, and by the way, your sins are forgiven as well. Go and sin no more. Jesus did this all throughout scripture. Physical needs opened doors for him to meet the truer spiritual need. And so it's true with everyone else that we experience. And the last thing that we must do with this light is live in the light. Live in it. Live in it. Don't step out from underneath the cloud. Stay under the cloud. Stay in the light. Can I tell you, one of the strongest things you will ever do in your life is simply just staying in a world that is so con convinced that like any trouble whatsoever, they just run. I'll just go to the next thing. I'll find something else. Go to the next job. Go to the next city. Go to the next. Just stay. Stay in the light. The world we live in, there is darkness all around. A darkness that you and I both know can be felt. Remain in the light. Don't leave. What does that look like? It looks like allowing God access into every single crevice of your heart and life. Nothing is kept from him. Everything is available for him. Everything is exposed before him. God, you know everything. I don't want there to be any dark corners of my life or of my heart. Look at what 1 John chapter 1 says. It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all 
unrighteousness. Ephesians chapter five and verse eight says, for you, watch this, for you were once in darkness, but praise God, now you are in the light in the Lord. Walk now as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Walk as children of the light, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Live in the light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Receive me. Know me. Allow me to transform your life in every single way. And then go and be light to the world around you living as smack dab in the middle of the light as you possibly can. If you follow me, I will lead you there. I am that light. I am what you long for. I am what you truly need. I hope you were blessed by this message and I truly hope you heard the Lord speaking to you through it. Before you go, Make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new message is posted. And make sure to leave us a comment below sharing what God spoke to you and how he used this message in your life. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.